Well, good morning, America, and welcome to your daily dose of scripture news and commentary. I'm Stan Grant. Today is April the 9th, 2024, and with that, Happy New Year! Whoa, wait just a minute. Somebody would say, what do I mean by the fact that I just said Happy New Year? Well, yesterday marked the last day of the year on the Hebrew calendar, and today marks the start of the Hebrew New Year. Now, you've heard me say it before, but America is the house of Israel in Scripture. We're the Saxon portion of Israel, and we've got Hebrew roots, and so this is actually the start of the new year for us, according to the Lord. It's different than the Gregorian calendar that we use culturally and around the world. So with that happy new year, um, that, you know, as I was thinking about this, to me, this is just yet one more coincidence, co coincidence, you know, regarding yesterday's <clears throat> solar eclipse. At the very time that the solar eclipse was reaching totality in the United States, that being the house of Israel, the sun was setting on the day in Jerusalem, and there the house of Judah. And sunset in Jerusalem would mark the beginning of the new day, which in this case was also the beginning of the Hebrew New Year. So, so as, the, as the sun was being eclipsed here in the house of Israel, the new year was starting uh, for the Hebrew people in Jerusalem as of the same time, literally down to the same hour. And there are just too many coincidences about yesterday's eclipse to ignore. I think it's going to be interesting to see what this new year holds for all of the tribes of Israel, that being the house of Judah, the Jewish portion of Israel, as well as the house of Israel, the Saxon portion of Israel, Isaac's sons, apostrophe Sax, sons, or the Saxons. It's going to be an interesting year for us. So again, happy new year. Um, yesterday's video really had kind of a prophetic flair to it. And I was able to have some conversation with a couple of people afterwards. Had a, had a friend of mine from the Seattle, Washington area text me and we were, we were binging some ideas back and forth and just having some conversations about the content. And so I want to continue with that theme today as we begin this new year. And this is just something that came to me really over the course of the weekend. So this is just fresh in my mind. I just want to get it out there while it's, while it's fresh in my head. Something that modern Christians have done is they throw out the Old Testament when it comes to interpreting prophecy. So they'll be reading along through the book of Revelation and they'll see that John is writing about something in Revelation and they think that it's a new thing. Well, we need to read a prophecy in the New Testament and then instead of just, you know, looking to create some new narrative, we need to look to the Old Testament prophets to see how they connect. We, we kind of make up these free-floating narratives with the New Testament prophecies and those free-floating narratives don't match anything in Scripture. They don't match anything that the Old Testament prophets saw. And so what we end up with is... is a mix of truth and fiction, and which is which is truth and lies. Let's just call it for what it is. It's 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 a fable. So we end up with fables, rather than a, rather than a solid interpretation of the prophecies contained within the New Testament. Well, you've heard me say it before. We've got to let Scripture interpret Scripture, and that requires us to fold in Old Testament prophets. It requires us to fold in Old Testament prophecies and then lay them against anything that's revealed in the New Testament because a lot of people don't realize this. Every prophecy in the Old Testament is foundational to understanding any prophecy in the New Testament. You cannot detach them one from the other. So all of the Old Testament prophets are very much in play today and it's really kind of sad to see within the United States how we've thrown out the Old Testament. We just ignore it. We don't read it anymore. Well, still takes a complete Bible to make a complete Christian. So, so that's been my rule of thumb. It's to take any of the New Testament prophecies that I see, layer them against what I see in the Old Testament, and see where they match up. Because there's a, there, the Old Testament is rich in prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled for the house of Israel and for our nation. And they come into play heavily in all New Testament prophecies. So... <clears throat> that said, I was, I was reading some scripture over the course of the weekend, and 
a, a passage in Psalms just kind of popped out at me and it connected with something in the New Testament, a New Testament prophecy that's pivotal. And I want to show you that. I want to show you this connection between these two prophecies in Scripture. And I think it'll help shed some light on something that's soon going to bubble to the surface. Um, I want to start in Psalms chapter 2. David, writing under the unction of the Holy Spirit, he, he prophesies something over the tribes of Israel, as well as the world, and then the coming Messiah, which you see the Messiah hadn't shown up on the scene yet at that point. So listen to this prophecy that David is writing about that concerns Israel, the world, and the Messiah in Psalms 2. David says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now, for context, to help you understand who David's talking about here, David is, is recognizing that the tribes of Israel are God's anointed. He recognizes them as God's anointed in several prophecies in the Psalms. He even refers to them as God's prophets, saying, touch not mine anointed. He's talking about the tribes of Israel there when he says that. So, so David, throughout some of his prophecies, recognizes the tribes of Israel as God's anointed. And so what, who he's talking about here is God's chosen people, that being Israel. See, the church didn't exist yet. And, and the, the church is not a nation that is putting constraints upon the kings of the earth. This is the nation of Israel that is putting constraints upon the rulers of the world, upon the, the heathen, upon the kings of the earth, and they rage against that. And, they're, and the kings of the earth are saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. We don't like these constraints. Well, then as David continues prophesying down in verses 4 through 6, it says that he that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them, that's the heathen, in his wrath, and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. Now, we know that that king is King Jesus. David was looking forward here to an event that would, would come in the future. And ultimately, David is describing Jesus' reign here on earth. But before you get to that point, I want you to notice that in the lead up to that, the Lord's anointed, that's the people of Israel, the tribes of Israel, the Saxons, the house of Israel, and that would include the United States of America today, they're a problem to the global community. The, the nations and the kings of the earth rage against the constraints that are being put upon them by we the people, the United States. And again, we're descendants of Israel. We are Israel. Now, God calls that nation Zion here. And ultimately, what he says here is, my king is going to sit upon that throne of Zion. They're going to have no king but King Jesus. They're going to be one nation under one God. Now, this indicates to me because the heathen are raging against this nation and God says, I'm going to put my king upon this throne. This indicates to me that rulership over this nation is being sought after and contested by the world system. The world system wants to put its man or its woman upon the throne over the house of Israel. And God says, uh-uh, not going to happen. It's going, to be, it's going to be my choosing. It's going to be my son that sits in the executive branch, in the executive office of my nation. You see, the nations of the world want to govern us. They want to govern the house of Israel because of our supremacy. We're the global superpower. See, see Israel will, we're, we're putting constraints on the global community that it does not like. We're forcing the entire globe to march to the drumbeat of our dollar bill to the drumbeat of our foreign policy, to the drumbeat of what we can do with our military. And we do that because we're the global superpower. And, and because of our power then in the world, we're acting as a global restrainer against the beast system. We are enemy number one to global tyranny. It knows that it has to deal with the United States in order to perpetuate 
all of its will around the world. So the beast system knows that it's got to take down the United States because we're a restrainer against its agenda. But then we see here that God wins and his king is going to sit upon the throne of this nation. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a little bit of the upshot that I saw in Psalms chapter 2. Well, as I read through verse 6, I immediately thought of another passage of scripture, but this one is in the New Testament. And I want to go there for just a second because I want, as I said, I want to layer these passages against each other. I want to go into 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we're going. And Paul in 2 Thessalonians is also addressing this restraint against the beast system. There, there's your common ground. There's your common link. That's what, I, that's what kind of hit me was this common ground. David's talking about a restrainer. Well, Paul also is talking about a restrainer against the beast system here in 2 Thessalonians 2. In verses 6 and 7, this is what he says. He says, And know ye not what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth, that word letteth means to, means to restrain, he who now restrains will restrain. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now, in short, Paul is saying, he's, he's telling the Thessalonians in his letter here, he's telling them that in the last days, there's going to be a restraining force that's going to be holding back the world system. It's going to be holding back the beast system and, and all of the lawlessness that the beast system wants to promote. It's letting. It, that means it's restraining. He who letteth will let, is what it says in verse 7. That's that restraining force. Again, letting means restraining in the Greek. He who restrains will restrain. And so there's a system that's in place that's restraining or holding evil at bay around the world. And, and so what Paul is describing here to the Thessalonians is the global policeman that's going to exist in the last days that's, that's a roadblock to what the world system and what the world community wants to push upon the rest of the world. And you see, they embrace the mystery of iniquity. We embrace the rule of law. They embrace the, the mystery of iniquity, which is lawlessness, and they want to let lawlessness govern the globe. But there's a global restrainer that's keeping that agenda at bay. And it's going to keep that agenda at bay until... Last part of verse 7. It says, The mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who restraineth will restrain until... Until when? Until he's taken out of the way. The restrainer is going to be taken out of the equation, taken out of the picture. And then when that occurs, after that occurs, then in verse 8, it says, And then shall that wicked be revealed. It's talking about the son of perdition here. Then the wicked one's going to be revealed, whom the Lord is going to consume with the spirit of his mouth, and he's going to destroy him with the brightness of his coming. That son of perdition will be revealed after the restrainer is taken out of the way. It's after the power of the holy people is scattered, as it says in Revelation chapter 13. Now again, we're layering a New Testament prophecy right here, because Paul is talking prophetically. He's, he's prophesying here. And we're layering that against what the Old Testament prophets say. And in this case, Psalms 2, because they're both talking about a restrainer. Well, if you put it all together, it comes down to this. This is what came to me on Sunday. Both David and Paul, again, they're talking about a restraining force against the beast system. Well, David clearly identifies that as the tribes of Israel. They're the Lord's anointed, and, and the kings of the earth rage against them. Well, since Scripture interprets Scripture, I believe that David and Paul are talking about the same people group and governmental entities. And, and, and Paul 
doesn't say that explicitly here. He just says, he says, uh, let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, verse 5. He says, hey, you know who I'm talking about. He says, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? So what this indicates to me is that Paul had taught the Thessalonians on this, and he's writing, he's reminding them in this letter who it was that he taught them about. He doesn't say it explicitly here. I wish he did, but he doesn't do that. But he's saying, hey, you already know who's holding the evil back. You know who that restraining force is going to be in the last days. I believe that Paul taught them that it was the house of Israel. Now, if he's teaching what David taught, then, then he would have also taught the Thessalonians that the house of Israel would be the global restraint in the last days, that they would be the global policemen. And so Paul is looking forward almost 2,000 years, and he's teaching or prophesying of a time when the house of Israel is going to be the lone superpower, and the global system is going to detest it, and it's going to want to cast it off, and the beast system wants lawlessness. They don't want the laws of God carried by our culture. But then Paul also takes it a little bit further, and he teaches something that David did not. He shows us that at some point, that restraining force, the restraining nation, is going to be taken out of the way. And it's only going to be with the help of a traitor, not a traitor as in trading goods, a traitor as in treason. It's going to be done with the help of a traitor that's on the inside, an insider, that's sitting in a position of authority within our nation, acting above the law, and the beast system needs the help of an insider. They need the help of a Judas to take us down. And that's what allows them to infiltrate and to destroy us from within and to take us down from within. And then they can scatter the power of the holy people, according to what you see in Revelation chapter 13. The restrainer has to be taken out of the way. But now, according to David, we know that God is going to have the last say. And his son, Jesus, is going to sit upon the throne of Zion. That, that, that contention for rulership over this nation is going to come to a head, and it's going to last for a brief season, but God is still going to have his way, and God's going to win, but it's not going to be before we're taken out of the way. We're taken down as a nation first. Friends, that's the picture that's in play right now in the United States of America. And that picture is soon to come to a head. I think all of the pieces are in place. Things are shaping up for that. And it's going to come to a head here soon. And I believe that we could see it happen this year, this very year. Now, go to my Patreon channel, go to my, go to my website, heritageministries.us, and go to the media page, and you can access my Patreon channel there, and you can find some pretty in-depth teaching on all of this. I'm trying to get this in under 20 minutes, so I've got to hustle here, but you can find some in-depth teaching on all of this, uh, and you need to know this information. I mean, you can subscribe to Patreon for 5, 10, 15 bucks for three months worth, and then you can unsubscribe if you want to, but that'll get you access to that information that you need. So visit my website, heritageministries.us, access all of my media content, and you can get some very detailed teaching on all of this. And wisdom and, st wisdom and knowledge is going to be the st stability in the times that we're coming into. So I want to wrap up with this. Suffice it to say, as I said yesterday as we concluded, America as we know it exists on borrowed time. Very, very borrowed time. I want to close with the word of the Lord for America. America, you are the house of Israel in Scripture. You are my people, and America is my nation. You are my Zion, a city set upon a hill, a light to the world. Return to me, and I will return to you. Repent, and I will restore you. Come out of your prison of unbelief, fear, and intimidation, and remember the words found in Psalms 33 and verse 12, which say, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, and the people whom he hath chosen for his own inheritance. Stand out.